Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as, as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular is a series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And this particular lesson will focus particularly in that idea an everlasting covenant. What What is an everlasting covenant? How long does that last? What is that implied? And so forth. This is a lesson number four in our series for April 24 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father, we have come recognizing your presence with us. We're so thankful for these opportunities to come and discuss the truths we find in Scripture describing your character and the way you behave and how you've treated people in the past. May we now understand better than we have before about the everlasting covenant is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Think about the challenges God has had down through the generations with our sin-sick world. He began with a perfect garden in a perfect world with Adam and Eve. Before very many years, he had to destroy that whole world in a flood and restart with Noah. And again, after relatively few years, things were so, were so bad again that he had to choose Abraham, calling him away from, and of course in his early years he's called Abram, calling him away from the evil influences of his family and his environment to restart again. He tried several times to work with the descendants of Abraham. Following God's directions, Moses took them out of Egyptian captivity. Zerubbabel, many years later, and Joshua, and a very small percentage of the Israelites, went back to Palestine after the Babylonian captivity. In New Testament times, Jesus had to admit that his efforts for the Israelites had been largely unsuccessful. So, he restarted with the Christian church. Very quick question. Yeah. Zerubbabel, Joshua? Joshua was the high priest, and Zerubbabel was the descendant of David, the... the, the he wasn't a king any longer. He was, he was the, but he was the one designated as a leader. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And he was a, he was an ancestor of Jesus. Okay. This is Joshua. No. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Okay, right. Joshua was the high. So a high priest he had to be from which tribe? He had to be from Judah. No. Levi. High, Levi. Pri high priest had to right. be from Levi. Right, right. Zerubbabel, as the descendant of David yeah. and so forth, had to be from the tribe of Judah. Judah. Okay. That Christian church had a marvelous beginning with the apostles and the disciples, but deteriorated until needing the Protestant Reformation, which reemphasized the necessity of following Scripture alone. But after another 300 years, the Protestant churches were not much different from the so-called mother church they had left. Finally, Seventh-day Adventists arose following the Great Advent Awakening. Are we going to succeed when so many in the past have failed. I am reminded uh, of Ellen White's statement, we have nothing to fear about the future except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and His teachings. Yes. And His teachings. That doesn't mean how, the way we went, it's the way the Lord has led us. Yes. And sometimes we haven't let the Lord lead us. If we had let the Lord lead us, lead us, we would have been in the kingdom a long time ago, she told us. And the complaint would be, you don't listen. Yes. 3ABN recently has been showing, uh, I guess you'd call it a series, of uh, where the Waldensies and all those people, oh, yeah. the, the mountainous oh, terrain, yeah. and they oh, yeah. actually take you right into where they hold up inside the yeah. mountains here and yep. there. It's just amazing that they survived any of them. We, we traveled up there one time and, and the Tor Palici and um, I went up there and I, I knew about this and so I was determined to find the place. So we followed the trail out there. Even science says, go out there, you'll find the place where, where they could all, a whole bunch of people could hide. And I started looking for I could not find that place, so help me. And my wife was getting very upset with me. We need to go with other things we need to see. And finally, looking up underneath a rock like this, you have to sort of bend down, sort of look up. Oh, yeah. And you go, and there's a room down in there that would hold 200 people easily. Amazing. Yeah, we went in there and we yeah. stood. Amazing. 
Beautiful, beautiful. The Piedmont, the college. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. Well, repeatedly, God had reached out to the human race, offering promises and covenants through the generations. In this lesson, we will focus primarily on his relationship with Abram, Abraham, Abraham, Abram slash Abraham. It was God's first recorded opportunity to spell out in considerable detail what he had in mind for the plan of salvation. So what can we learn about God from his names? Let's start with some of the details now, because we can learn a lot from names. What do the different names mean? Why did God change Abram's name to Abraham, for example? Well, down through the generations, names have been associated with movements, truths, ideas. What comes to mind when you think of Martin Luther, yeah. Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, or Dorcas in the Bible. The Semitic peoples in the Old Testament, dwelling in the Near East, attached great importance to the meaning of names. Jim? The Hebrews also thought of a name always as, thought. Me, always thought of a name as indica indicating either the personal characteristics of the one named or the thoughts and emotions of the one giving the name, or attendant circumstances at the time the name was given. Article on Exodus 6, 3. I, I can tell you there's a tribe in Africa that tends to, believe it or not, they tend to name all their kids based on which day of the week they're born. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how? <laughs> of course, they get other names after a while, but, you know, some of them still go all the way through their life with, Oh, you're Friday and you're Thursday. They have different names for it, but yeah, interesting. So there's a way of getting named based on the circumstances under which you're born, right? Yeah. When God first approached Abraham, Abram, he identified himself under the name Yahweh or Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, as recorded in Genesis 15, 7. What do we know about that, Charles? The name Yahweh, though appears... 6,828 times in the Old Testament is somewhat shrouded in mystery. It seems to be a form of the verb Hayah, to be, in which case it would mean the eternal one, the ex existent one, the self-existing one, the self-sufficient one, or the one who lives eternally. The divine attributes that seem to be emphasized by this title are those of self-existence and faithfulness. They point to the Lord as the living God, the source of life, in contrast with the gods of the heathen, which had no existence apart from the imagination of their worshipers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have to smile when I, when I see that quotation because here's the contrast. God, the God of the Jews, this Yahweh that we believe in, is self-existent. The, the, the name literally means to be. So he, he's, he, he gives rise to others. He creates other things and so forth. These other gods, what are they? They only exist in people's imagination. That's all, the only existence they have is somebody's imagination. When God approached Moses in the desert while he was herding sheep, he appeared in a burning bush and asked Moses to remove his shoes. When Moses asked who he was, God said, I am who I am. Mm. What would a name like that mean? Look at the context, or just the verse anyway. God said, I am who I am. This is what you must say to them, to the children of Israel. The one who is called I am has sent me to you. The one who is self-existent sends me. Well, this, God, God really doesn't exist. He is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that is to exist. We, we exist for, we have a, we're finite. Yeah. But the infinite one is. It's, yeah, yeah. It, technically that's correct. This name implies not only that God is the eternal everlasting God, but also that he is a personal friend to human beings. God wanted Moses and earlier Abram to know his name. So what comes to mind when you think of the name Yahweh or Jehovah or God? 
Do you think of love, kindness, and care? Or do you think of fear, strictness, and discipline? When thinking about the names of God, it is very important for us to remember, and if you are interested in any of these materials that we study here and talk about our handouts, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. But here we have in bold type, it is very important for us to remember that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't have the name Jesus back in those days, so you might maybe we should just have said Christ, but he was a pre-existent Messiah. Well, he was named as Yahshua, which is in the, uh, not the... But that's still a human, human name, still. Yeah, but he was the anointed. Yeah, with the, right. The, the, Before the, David was, I, I am. am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. Right. John, John 8. We must never forget that. And I, for people who, who have a real question with that, I want you to listen to these three verses, four, four or five verses I'm going to read you. Look first at Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, this is Jesus to the disciples and some others, on Sunday evening after the resurrection, then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. When he talks about the writings of uh, uh, the Law of Moses, the writings of the Prophets and the Psalms, what's he talking about? That's the entire Old Testament, the only Bible that had been written up to that time. And then compare 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want you to remember, my brothers, now this is Paul talking, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses? They were all under the protection of the cloud. Remember that cloud that hung down? It was a shade during the day and it was a light at night and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was? Jesus Christ himself. Christ himself. And one more, John 5, 39. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And how many scriptures were there when he, Jesus spoke that? What we call the Old Testament. Only what we call the Old Testament. And these very scriptures speak about me, Jesus talking. Okay? So I think we've got pretty good evidence that he was the God of the Old Testament. But we need to understand that there are many different names given to God in the Old Testament. In addition to the name Elohim, which means God, and Yahweh, another name appears for God, El Shaddai. The name El Shaddai was used almost exclusively by Moses in the books of Genesis and Job. And what do we know about those two books? They were written by Moses. Written by Moses. They were the first two books that Moses wrote, and they were written while he was out there herding sheep in the Midianite de uh, in, wilderness. In uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay, so who do we have next here? Is that yours, Kerry? I guess it is. I was miles away. I'm sorry. Uh, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And thou shalt be a father of a multitude of nations, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. And... Uh, the name also appears in Genesis 28.3 where Isaac says that El Shaddai will bless Jacob, make him fruitful and multiply him. That's from the study guide for Monday, April 19. It's very interesting that both of those promises were made to men who at that point in their lives had no children. Yeah. No children. I had a gentleman used to cut my hair when I was living in uh, Ohio, in Toledo, Ohio. He was a Jew who became a Christian. Mm. And he would tell me stories when cutting my hair. And he says, you know that word El Shaddai is, uh, is a child lying on the father's chest oh. and drinking milk from the father's breast. The father or the mother? Father. Really? Yes. 
And mm. he says, no, that's why I think somewhere, I, as I was reading, it, the, the, it's the Father you're drinking from me. This is El Shaddai. The, I'm not, if you have come across this, but when I was reading this, El Shaddai, he says, that is, that's really, truly what the expression means. They might have made a bag that had a mouthpiece on, you don't know. Yeah. El Shaddai first appears in the Hebrew text of Genesis 17, 1 and 2, associated with Abraham. The word for God here is El, El Shaddai, often translated as God Almighty, as in, found in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 52. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God, El, El Shaddai. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants, you childless soul. <laughs> <laughs> From American Bible Society, Good News Translation, 1992. So let's break it down a bit. The word El is related to Elohim. The beginning Elohim created, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So this is the God that's, all, that's powerful, the God who creates, the God who, you know, did everything back in Genesis 1. And it stands for omnipotence, might, and transcendence. This title for God, Elohim, is seen all through the Genesis creation account. The word El from, from it is translated, El is a singular, and Elohim applies to, to the plural, uh, is translated God about 200 times, and it too con connoted the powerful, the powerful God. Shad Shaddai, here's Charles, this here's your, your words. Shaddai, it means breast, giving the idea of one who supplies, who nourishes, and who satisfies. Connected with the word El, it portrays the notion of the mighty and powerful one who can supply and nourish. Well, no, that's, you can put make a parallel with John six sixty three. Mm -hmm. It's the words he has spoken, our spirit, and life. Yeah. yeah. That's from our Bible study guide, page fifty two. There are a number of verses in the Bible that use the expression El El Shaddai, which is often translated Almighty God, and there's many of them, but Genesis 28, 3, 35, 11, 43, 14, 49, 25 are just some examples. Does God really need to tell us that He is Almighty? Would we want to worship a God known as the weak God? Or the frail God? Or I would add the fish god, or the goat god, or the... <laughs> or the merciful god. But, but here is a god who is uh, the great I am. Yeah. And he has a relationship with the child, uh, Shaddai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, people in the ancient Near East often chose names very carefully. Jim? Though the names of God come with spiritual and theological significance, in su such usage does not end with God alone. Names of people in the ancient Near East were not just meaningless forms of identification, as often they are to us. To name a girl Mary or Susie does, excuse me, does not make such a difference today. For the ancient Semites, however, human names came heavy laden with spiritual significance. All Semitic names of people have meaning and are usually and usually consist of a phrase or short sentence comprising of a wish or an exposition of gratitude on the part of the parent. For example, Daniel means God is my judge. Joel means Yahweh is God. Nathan means gift of God. Adult Bible Study guide, Bible study guide. So, and if we were, if we were able to, if we were to take the whole rest of our time, we could go through a whole list of Bible names, and every one of them has some kind of meaning. And well, more, I like the James Yeshua means healer. Yeah. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. In more modern times, people are inclined to give nicknames to others. It's very difficult to change one's legal name, so we usually ignore it and substitute a nickname for a person. And you all can think of a lot of people who've got to be known by yes. some nickname. Yes. So what do we understand when we see God changing the name of Abram, which means father is exalted, to Abraham, which means father of a multitude? 
Remember, he's speaking this to what kind of a man? <laughs> There's no Child, childless. childless. Yes, I am a childless. How does this relate to God's covenant promise to us and to Abraham? Imagine God having promised Abraham several times after he was 75 years of age that he would give him many children and finally at the age of 99, married to a woman who had long since been menopausal, repeating the promise that he would be the father of many peoples. <laughs> I don't know. I've often wondered about that. How many years ago roughly would that have been? Thousands, right? Yeah. Would I mean, they have been that worn out? Like well, we are Abraham today? lived to be a hundred and seventy-five or seventy-five years right. age, so of age, he and he, he had he had six more sons yeah. after Isaac. Yes, yeah. so well, that was with Keturah, wasn't it? With Keturah, yeah. So Genesis had, twenty-five. He was fit enough. <laughs> well, but I mean, you know, it's not just you. What about your wife, who's menopausal already? Yeah. That's why she laughed, wasn't it? That's why she well, laughed. we're going to talk we about that in a moment. <laughs> oh, I put my foot in it. <laughs> Let us dig a little deeper into the idea of covenant. Genesis 12, 1 and 2 and 7. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives, your father's home, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be blessing, you will be a blessing. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, this is the country that I'm giving, going to give to your descendants, Good News Bible. Wow. In those two verses, Genesis 12, 1 and 2, the first stage of God's covenant promise to Abraham, Abraham, there, uh, there, there are three. Is there between, are three stages, in other words. Yes. God appeared, approached Abraham, gave him a command, and then made him a promise. Okay, so the first two stages are what? Command. God gives him a command, he makes a promise. Okay, go ahead. The approach expresses God's gracious election of Abram to the first major figure of his special covenant of grace. The command involves the test of total trust in God, he did not quite total trust. Mm. <laughs> he failed. Uh, Hebrew 11, 8, the promise, Genesis 12, 1 to 3 and 7, though made specifically to Abraham's descendants, ultimately includes a promise to the whole human race, Genesis 12, 3 and Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Yes. And that's our school Bible study guide. We're going to see more about that in a moment or two. In order to be better understood, in order to better understand God's covenant promises and relationship with Abraham, Abraham consider Hebrews 11.8. Let's just look at that in a moment. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. So that's the kind of relationship he had. God says it, I'm on my way. So, also in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, we can look at that. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, your father's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. This was when he was at age 75. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. All the nations. Okay? These verses point out the first phase of God's covenant. God gave Abraham a command, and then he promised to bless him if he followed it. Okay, Gary? Genesis 15, and I'm reading from verses 7 through 20. Then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who led you out of Ur in Babylonia, the Chaldees, to give you this land as your own. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Um, Chaldees is a, is, is a challenge to understand this. Yeah. The Chaldeans moved. They were a roving tribe. And so while many people think that Ur of the Chaldees is a city, there was a city by the name of Ur way down in the, just right on the Persian Gulf. But there's also a city named Ur, uh, which is currently still named Urfa, 
up in the south uh, west, southeastern corner of Turkey. And it's a short distance from Haran, which is Ab where the place where Abraham went to. So it's much more likely, and, and the people who live in Ur at, or, and around that area are absolutely certain, they will tell you this is the place where Abraham was born. So I do not believe that Abraham started way down there at the Persian Gulf, traveled way up to Turkey, and then back down to, to uh, uh, Israel, that, um, to Canaan. That doesn't make sense. He traveled from Urfa in, in Turkey, across the, the, the Euphrates River to Haran, and then to on, on down, which makes much more sense. I think you said Ellen White also made comment to that. Ellen White endorses the idea that he had to cross the Ur that's down in the, in the southern part of, of Iraq is on the western side of the Euphrates. Yeah. But she says specifically he had to cross the Euphrates to get there. So that meant that the Ur that he comes from had to be on the other side of the Euphrates. Okay, sorry. Sovereign Lord, uh, no, let me back up a little. Abram asked, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that it will be mine? He answered, Bring me a cow, a goat, and a ram, each of them three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. Abram brought the animals to God, cut them in half, and placed the halves opposite each other in two rows. But he did not cut up the birds. Vultures came down on the bodies, but Abram drove them off. When the sun was down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and fear and terror came over him. The Lord said to him, Your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and when they leave that foreign land, they will take great wealth with them. You yourself will live to a ripe old age, die in peace and be buried. It will be four generations before your descendants come back here because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked they must be punished. When the sun is set and was dark, smoking fire pot and a flaming torch suddenly appeared and passed between the pieces of the animals. Then and there the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He said, I promise to give your descendants all this land from the border of Egypt to the river Euphrates, including the lands of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And that's from the Good News Bible. Can you imagine Abraham going out to all these people who lived around him and says, <clears throat> My kids are going to take over your territory. My kids are going to take... <laughs> yeah. I don't think he did that. Oh. This passage, was there ever a time when Abraham's descendants ruled from Egypt to the Euphrates? David's time. Just wait. We're going to talk about it. This passage is an expansion on what God had said to Abraham earlier. Notice that God appeared to Abraham, probably in a vision, and then called him to obey certain commands that God gave him, followed by divine promises of great blessing. So what are the first two steps again? Give a command, promise a blessing, right? So why that strange ceremony of cutting animals in half and laying them on the ground and passing between them? Recent archaeological evidence has demonstrated that this was a common way to enter into a serious agreement among the people from whom Abraham came. God was meet to him, meeting him where he was. It is believed that cutting the animals in half and laying them on the ground implied that if one broke the covenant, this is what would happen to him. That's a pretty stark kind of a no, way. No coercion there, is <laughs> None at all. But that's, God said, okay, if that's what you're familiar with, if that's, well, we would go to a lawyer, we would draw up a covenant, we'd sign it. Well, this is what they did. Right. Cut animals in half. Finally, when Abraham was 99 years old, we come to the third and final stage of the divine covenant God made with him. When he was 99 years old and it seemed almost impossible for Abraham to have his own children, especially from Sarah, God appeared to him for the third covenant-making experience. Once again, God said, Obey me and always do what is right, and if you do, 
I will change your name. I will make an everlasting covenant with you to give you and your many descendants a territory from the Euphrates to, you, to Egypt. So the first part of the covenant was what? God gives a command. The second part is God gives a promise. The third part is God fulfills his promise, right? Mm, yeah. Okay, moreover, that covenant was to be an everlasting covenant applying to all who were to be Abraham's descendants. Galatians 7, 3, 7, and 29, we, we know, we're, we're told. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So we're not talking about blood descendants, we're talking about spiritual faith descendants, right? Yes. So how do you think that relates to the famous first angel's message recorded in Revelation 14, 6 and 7? It is the Almighty God, or is the Almighty God still speaking? How many people are included in His promise? What do we have to do to be a part of it? Do you remember what does it say in Romans, I mean, Revelation 14, 6 and 7? Let's look at that. Come out of our my people. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. How many does that leave out? None. None. He said in a loud voice, honor God and praise his greatness. So there's something we have to do. For the time has come for him to judge, worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So what are we supposed to be doing? Worship. Honoring God, worshiping his name. Is the Almighty God still speaking? Abraham was asked to follow some of God's instructions, which at times may have seemed almost impossible to carry out. Jim? God called Abraham to be a teacher of his people. Of his word. Of, of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few, but not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. Okay, now let me interrupt for a second. When the children of Israel went down into Egypt, how many went with them? Seventy... Something. Seventy that we have named. Right. Yeah. Or specifically identified. If Abraham had more than a thousand people of his house, their family, how many, do you think, how many do you think Isaac and Jacob had? <laughs> probably a lot. Four, right. And they probably all were considered to be a part of Abraham's, Isaac's, and Jacob's family. Okay, go ahead. Let's see, where do we Such a household? Okay. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating method would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him that he will command his children and his household, household after him, Genesis 8, 19. So now we know that his household included what kind of people? People who would listen and take instruction. Not only that, but they were heads of households. Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were won. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and, just, and judgment, Genesis 8, 19. And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained, and many a roving Canaanite whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham, his servant, tarried at that altar to offer Sacrifice to Jehovah, Ellen White, edu Book Education, page 187. I want you to think, look at that for a moment. So amidst those pagan fertility cult worshiping peoples, mm. there were a number of people who recognized the superiority of worshiping the true God. And even though we don't know who they were, someday we will know. Right because they wandered around like Abraham did. And when they came to these places where he had set up 
altars to the living God, they said, this is the kind of worship I want to be involved in. Charles? Abraham's household comprised... This is a, this is a similar passage and from a different book. Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls, those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God, found a home in his encampment. And here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families, and his methods of government would be carried out in the households over which they should preside. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, page 141. Wow. So Abraham was conducting a university. Yeah. You know, when you read it, you could almost tell this is Ellen White. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Sometimes we as human beings tend to think that we have to do everything ourselves. But God's promises are way beyond the capacity of any human group to accomplish on their own. Thus we need God's what? God's right. grace. Abraham needed God's grace. But we still need to press on and do our best to carry out our part of the agreement. Gary? Uh, I'm reading from Genesis 18 verse 19. I have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to do what is right and just. If they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. From the Good News Bible. I'm reading from James chapter 2, verse 17. So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. It's from Good News Bible. So what do you think? Did God ask too much of Abraham? Is God asking too much of us? Are we keeping God's covenant or are we breaking it? Isn't God's covenant the grace, the promise? Yes. Yes. But we've talked, the first part of the covenant is what? God right. gives a command. Yes. Right, right. The second part is? He keeps promise. He gives a promise. Yes. The third part is, it's fulfilled, fulfilled if we meet our conditions, right? Yes. So, are we keeping God's commandment or are we breaking it? So how do you break a covenant? By unfaithfulness, disobedience, and ignoring the established relationship. But notice that it is not the conditions of bestowal that are violated, but rather the condition of fulfillment. So the covenant is still there. Right. The covenant is still there. But if you don't meet the conditions, what does God do? What can he do? Yes, his side of the bargain. The covenant is still available. Think of the complete story of the Israelites in the Old Testament and how because of their disobedience and rebellion they forfeited receiving God's ultimate blessing. I mean, look at the whole story of the Old Testament. Well, in our last lesson we studied how the rainbow was a promise to Noah and his descendants. In this lesson we are focused on Abraham and the necessity of circumcision. Oh dear. What, what was the point of circumcision? They can be recognized by it in one sense. Okay. Is that yours, Carrie, I think? Yes. Oh, sorry. I, I just looking there, and I, thinking about what you said. I was thinking about uh, the eight days uh, getting your, your clotting mechanism up. Right, exactly. Circumcision was destined, one, to distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles, from Ephesians 2.11. Two, to perpetuate the memory of Jehovah's covenant from Genesis 17, 11. Number three, to foster the cultivation of moral purity from Deuteronomy 10, 16. Number four, to represent righteousness by faith, Romans 4, 11. Number five, to symbolize circumcision of the heart, 
Run 229 and 6 to foreshadow the Christian rite of baptism from Colossians 2.11, 12 from the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 322-323, as okay. quoted in the Sabbath School Study Guide. Genesis 17.10, God said, You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. So now let's talk about the thing that Gary was thinking about. They were supposed to circumcise their, the boys at age 8 days. Eight. Why was that? Because they would have lost their blood. Okay, so what happens when, a, when a, a, a baby is still in the mother's womb, all the liver functions are basically taken on by the mother's liver. Yeah. And part of the liver's function is making the components that make blood clot. So when a baby is born, he has, he has what came from the mother initially. But that thing dips way down and then it... At, a, at, at age of about seven, six or seven days, it gets back to the fairly normal level, and actually by age eight days, it's actually about 120% of the clotting capacity of normal. So that's the time that God says, okay, this is the time you should circumcise your boys. Now let's talk about why God thought that was a necessary thing to do in those days. Remember that we're talking about people who lived in the midst of fertility cult worshiping uh, groups. What that meant is that you would go to a place where there was drinking, there was all kinds of stuff, and you would culminate your relationship to God by having sex with a male or female prostitute. That was what happened. So now if a, a young Israelite male shows up at one of those places, there's no question about the fact that he's an Israelite male, right? Yep. He's identifiable immediately. And that's, that's what God is doing. He's making it clear that these people are mine. They are distinct from all these other ones. But, you know, I, I wonder, there's another thing there, too, about cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you don't fully realize that necessarily until you've been in the medical profession. Yeah. While the rainbow continues to signify God's promise to all human beings for all eternity, the requirement of circumcision is no longer a necessary requirement for the people of God. By New Testament times, the meaning of circumcision had mostly been lost. Notice what Paul said about circumcision. Romans 4.11, he was circumcised later and his circumcision was a sign to show that because of his faith, God had accepted him as righteous before he had been circumcised. So let's look at the sequence there. It's really important to get this. God, Abraham was recognized by God at what point? He became God's friend at what point? Before he was circumcised. Before he was circumcised. Before he was circumcised. So the circumcision came after the faith, after the faith relationship. And so Abraham is the spiritual father of all who believe in God and are accepted as righteous by him, even though they are not circumcised. Galatians 5, 6, For when we are in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor the lack of it makes any difference at all. May, what matters is faith that works through love. By the way, who is this talking? Who's writing this? Paul. This Paul. Paul. Writing. And what do we know about Paul's background? He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of the scholar. Pharisees. <laughs> and what if you had said those words right here that he wrote down, what if you had said to them, he had said them to him back while he was still a Pharisee? Oh, they'd have banished him. <laughs> Chop your head off. <laughs> Galatians 6.15, it does not matter at all whether or not one is circumcised. What does matter is being a new creature. And we know that in Galatia, he had a tremendous battle with these probably Pharisees who had come along behind him to try to say, to be a Christian, you have to be first a Pharisee, you have to be first a, a circumcised Jew. So here we have two Pharisees one who had been so elevated that he was a part of the Sanhedrin fighting against lower level Pharisees who said you still have to follow all the rules 
Uh, that was, those must have been very interesting discussions. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, 18 and 19. If a circumcised man has accepted God's call, he shall not try to remove the mark of circumcision. And I can tell you, there is evidence that some of them, in, in, when they went down to Egypt, in the days when a lot of the Jews had got, went down to Egypt cause, to try to make things, well, the Jews down in Egypt a little while before the time of Christ had adopted many of the Greek customs. And the Greek customs were when you went to an exercise place, you exercised in the nude. You wore no, there were no clothing whatsoever. Well, immediately you would know who was a Jew. So there are actually some of the Jewish young men who've been circumcised at age eight days tried to undo their circumcision. Didn't work. For an uncircumcised man has accepted God's call, he should not get circumcised. Paul is saying now, that, does, that physical sign doesn't matter. For whether or not a man is circumcised means nothing. What matters is to obey God's commandments. As modern day Christians who study our Bibles, we have come to believe that we are saved by faith. That covenant relationship that is possible with God. But let us never forget that faith works. A faith that does not lead to action on the part of a Christian is a dead faith. Many are still tested as Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from the heavens, but he calls them by the teachings of his word and events of his providence. They may be required to abandon a career that promises wealth and honor, to leave congenial and prof profitable associations and to separate from kindred, to enter upon what appears to be only a path of self-denial, hardship and sacrifice. God has a work for them to do, but life of ease and the influence of friends and kindred would hinder the development of the very traits essential for, the, for its accomplishment. And he calls them away from human influences and aid and leads them to feel the need for his help and to depend upon him alone that he may reveal himself to them. Who is ready is the, who is ready at the call of providence to renounce cherished plans and familiar associations? Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126 and 127. Can you imagine Ellen White in those days and she was traveling to Europe, she finally traveled to Australia, and she was trying to get other people to go and take up responsibilities in some of those places, and it was like pulling teeth. How many places she traveled with in she this went country? went to New Zealand and helped yep. her. Yeah. New Zealand women were the first w women in the world to get the vote, and yeah. Ellen White was right behind them in the newspapers. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. What aspects of that covenant agreement with Abraham are still everlasting? Do we still believe that some of these covenants apply to us? Is it fair to say that when we read in Genesis 17, 3 through 5, what the changing of his name what the changing of his name indicates a change in the relationship between God and Abraham, as partially noted in item number 14 above? Abraham was the first of several men whose names God changed. Names were of much greater importance to the ancients than they are as to, to us. All Semitic names have meanings and usually consist of a phrase or sentence that expresses a wish or perhaps gratitude or in part of the parent. In view of the importance people themselves attach to the names, God changed the names of certain men to make them harmonize with their experiences, past or future. Abraham, meaning exalted father, does not appear in this form elsewhere in the Bible, but is found under the form Abiram, which meaning my father is exalted. See number 16.1. So there are some other people in the Old Testament known uh, by the name of Abiram, but that's the Hebrew. Remember that in Hebrew there are no vowels. So you have A-B-R-M, and you see if you leave out the vowels, what do you have? A-B-R-M. 
Abraham, right? Yeah. And, they find, and the Eblet tablets, didn't they find his Abraham's name? I think there? so, yeah. It is interesting to note that there are other others with the same name mentioned in these places. But in those passages, the name is spelled Abiram. Let us review now the three-stage covenant that God made with Abraham. God made a three-stage covenant with Abraham. The first is reported in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. The second in Genesis 15, verses 1 to 21. And the third in Genesis 17, verses 1 to 14. And that's from The Promise God's Everlasting Covenant, page 34. Okay, we've already talked a couple times about these three parts of the thing. God gives a command, He gives a promise, and then He fulfills it. And then he fulfills it. First of all, God called, assuming we meet the conditions, first of all, God called Abram to leave his country and his people and travel to an unknown land but he promised to give him a glorious group of descendants. God came again to Abraham and asked him to do that very strong covenant-making agreement, and God, in the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, passed between the cut pieces of animals. Do you think Abraham was frightened when he saw that? Did he understand that God was making an agreement with him? I'm trying to imagine how we would respond. I mean, would we say to God today, will you come and sign your name on the dotted line? <laughs> Despite all that, Abraham still did not have a child by Sarah. So what happens? Genesis 17, 1 to 14. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared uh, to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground and God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham, because I'm making you the ancestor of many nations. I will give you many descendants and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. That I will be your God and the God of your descendants. I will take, I will give to you and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, you also must agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants in future generations. You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy when he is eight days old, including slaves born in your homes and slaves bought for foreigners. This will show that there is a covenant between you and me. Each of each one must be circumcised, and this would be a physical sign to show that my covenant with you is everlasting. Any male who has not been circumcised will no longer be considered one of my people because he has not kept the covenant with me. So now when he's 99, God came back and said it was time to have the promised son. And so God asked Abraham to begin the process of circumcision to distinguish Abraham and his descendants from the fertility cult worshiping nations around him. Would you still have trusted God after he'd promised again and again to give you a child by Sarah even when she was past childbearing age? Is that a reasonable request? Is it any surprise that both Abraham and Sarah laughed at God's promises? And Sarah went on to lie to God about having laughed. <laughs> yes. I love that. Genesis 17, 17, and 18, 10 to 15. Read it for yourself. Abraham's final test came when he was 120 years old. I, actually, I think we have time to look at those two verses quickly. Genesis 17, 17. God speaking to Abraham. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he's 100 years old? And then coming back, the next chapter, chapter 18, one of them said, these are the three men who came to visit Abraham. One of them said to Abraham, nine months from now I will come back and your wife Sarah will have a son. And <laughs> how long did it take for him to finally realize it was God talking to him? 
Sarah was behind at the door of the tent listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old, and Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now she laughed to herself, now that I'm old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm so old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Notice that's Lord the Yahweh, okay? As I said, nine months from now I will return and Sarah will have a son. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied. You laughed. <laughs> this is God talking, right? Abraham's final test came when he was 120 years old. We know about that. I'm going to drop down here as I'm watching the process here for Abraham. This was a journey, primary reason for naming the scene of this event, Jehovah Jireh. We know about him taking his son Isaac to that place and being prepared to offer him. It was a constant reminder of the wonderful grace of the Jehovah who had wrought this deliverance. What a great and glorious deliverance it was that Jehovah's grace had provided and how unexpected and dramatic. Man's extremity is ever God's opportunity not only for deliverance, but to teach also wonderful lessons of his purpose as well. That's from Nathan Stone, Names of God, so forth. Do you know what your name means? What language does it come from? In the Bible, God went to extraordinary lengths, sometimes even changing people's names so that they could represent what that person, or what he wanted them, wanted to say to or through them. What would we do if God came and said, I'm changing your name? I'm changing your name. I want you to represent this for me. Thus he is making himself a personal, as personal as possible to his followers. God's promises are gestures of intimacy. We are told that God knows not only our names, but he doesn't have to count as long to try to count the hairs on my head anymore. <laughs> knows the number of hairs on our head. In response, how well do we know God? We've already studied several passages suggesting that the key to an everlasting relationship with God and eternal life is to know God well. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 and John 17, 3. Many Christians, perhaps rightfully, like to focus on God's love and his forgiveness of all their sins. But if God is all merciful and all forgiving, does he still require us to actually keep his commandments? Does he need our obedience? Do we believe that the greatest happiness comes to those who obey him? That's what the Bible says. The greatest happiness comes to those who live God's lifestyle and obey his commands. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to be your faithful people, to think like you, to direct our lives according to your plans for them. We know that this is the greatest happiness possible to human beings. May that be the experience of everyone here and all those who are listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.